CEO and a God, Kani Kolaha Dagwadoa. Hello, everyone. My name is Roy Boney Jr. Uh, I'm the Cherokee Language Program Manager, and today I'm going to be talking about the history of the Cherokee syllabary and all the evolutionary processes that went through to get to where we have it now. <clears throat> so let's get started. Uh, so 2021 is the uh, bicentennial anniversary of the Cherokee syllabary. Uh, Sequoia worked on the invention for a little over a decade. Uh, he started roughly in 1809, give or take a year, and he finished in 1821. Uh, while he was working on it, he was famously ridiculed by uh, critics, and he was sometimes dismissed as crazy by his own people, and he's even accused of witchcraft for trying to, to make this writing system. Uh, but despite all of this, he preserved on, or persevered, and he left a profoundly influential gift for the Cherokee people. Uh, it's a really great example of the resiliency and the intelligence of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, so Cherokees from all walks of life identify the Cherokee syllabary as a very common identifier. Everyone who sees the syllabary, they recognize it as a Cherokee thing, regardless of their politics, religion, or whatever differences that everyone has, everyone sees that and they're unified around that. So from its invention in the 19th century to its use today, uh, in our language revitalization efforts, the silver is a very strong symbol of Cherokee unity. So I'm going to start off here on the screen. You'll see an image of Sequoia. That's a portrait of him. Uh, his uh, accomplishment was a very profound uh, event, and at the time, it was astounding that you know one person invented a writing system. Uh, people in the era <coughs> called him Cadmus, who was a legendary Phoenician uh, who introduced the Greek, uh, the, who introduced the alphabet in Greek mythology. Uh, so the fact that a, a so-called uneducated man, a Cherokee man, developed the writing system really amazed everyone around the world when they heard about it. Uh, so within weeks of the Silver's introduction, uh, most Cherokees became literate in their own language in this writing system. Uh, Sequoia's acclaim immediately spread far and wide after that. Uh, this kind of bugged several non-Cherokees. There were some linguists. Uh, There's a guy named John Pickering who was trying to develop a, a universal alphabet for Native Americans at the time. So he's seen this as a detriment to his work, but uh, all the Cherokees you know, picked up on Sequoia's syllabary rather than his uh, 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 Native American alphabet from John Pickering. Uh, so. And here's an image of the spelling book that was put together by Daniel Buttrick and uh, Daniel, uh, David Brown, who was a Cherokee. So in addition to, uh, there's John Pickering, who was a white linguist trying to make an alphabet. There were some Cherokees that were trying to do this too, because Dan, uh, Dan Brown was a Cherokee himself. Uh, but initially, you know, this, this image you see on screen is from 1819, so that's pre-syllabary. So they were trying to write in phonetics uh, before as Sequoia had finalized his invention. Uh, <clears throat> so Cherokees readily adopted Sequoia's uh, syllabary instead of other alphabets because it came from with their own Cherokee community. Uh, the syllabary is both a practical and a, uh, a very strong source of national Cherokee pride. Uh, so a lot of historical resources call it a uh, alphabet, but actually it is a syllabary. So that means that uh, the characters combined to make a sound, so like you have ka or you have ah, well, there was a, which versus the vowel, so you have vowels and syllables, so they actually, actually call this a modified syllabary. Uh, what you see on the screen now is a, an image of Sequoia's original syllabary design, which is, shows in cursive, and right next to it you see an image of what it would become. Uh, so a fire was set by his wife and Cherokees in the community to his cabin, and this reportedly destroyed his early work on syllabary. Uh, so, but he worked with a setback, and he finalized the syllabary with 86 characters initially. Uh, this image on the screen too also is one of the few documents that we know that Sequoia wrote himself, and he actually has his signature on the bottom of the page. <clears throat> The image on the screen that you see now is an example of, it's claimed to be one of the old versions of the syllabary. This has 92 characters in it. It comes from a document from a guy named Traveler Bird, which some scholars say kind of discredited him, but some people in the community claim that this is a, he was real and had this real example of early Cherokee writing. Uh, but despite whether, you, if you believe this or not, uh, you know, Sequoia is 
uh, credit of developing the silver in isolation. And so there still are many oral Cherokee traditions that say there was writing prior to European contact. Uh, so in some of these accounts, uh, they say the writing was suppressed. Uh, there was a, a, a group of Cherokee scribes and priests that were kind of like the elites of the era. Uh, and they oppressed the people. So they were beaten back and the you know, Cherokees kind of took over for themselves. And so this group kind of receded, but they kept passing down the writing system. So that, that's just one of the oral traditions of where this writing might, it might have come from <laughs> and for pre-European contact. Uh, what you see on screen right now is a sample of what that might have looked like. This is developed by the uh, Cherokee Nation Language Advisory Council. Uh, this was a precursor to the Cherokee Language Consortium. And with the expertise in that group, they're Cherokee speakers. Uh, they, they did research and came up with these uh, shapes of, of the Cherokee syllables for all the 92 different sounds. <clears throat> so regardless, again, of the origin story of where this writing came from, Sequoia completed his work in 1821, and you see on screen that's how it ended up being what we know and use today. Uh, in 1828, uh, Jeremiah Everts, uh, he was a secretary for the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. Uh, that's a mouthful to say, so I'm going to call them the Missionary Board from now on. Uh, but he conducted an interview through an interpreter with Sequoia. Uh, he asked Sequoia why he made the silver, and Sequoia's response is really interesting. Uh, this is a quote from him that says, uh, putting ideas and words on paper were to Sequoia, they were like catching a wild animal and taming it. So you can see where Sequoia is coming from in terms of why he wanted to make this and how important he felt about it. Uh, so, when you think of the era in which Sequoia was developed in the syllabary, uh, most documents were written by hand. There were printing presses, but they were mostly used for English language. So, when you were writing by hand at this time, a lot of times there was ink. And so, these ink, uh, you had to have the nibs, so you would dip them in ink and you would write. And if you ever use that kind of writing, uh, you're familiar with, you got to kind of have really smooth motions as you write, because if you don't, they're going to have little blobs of ink on the paper and things like that, and so you can easily smear it as you're writing across. So that's why uh, Sequoia's initial syllabary looks very cursive. So you see on screen here a detail of some of that. Uh, it's you know very flowing, very curvilinear, and that's because he was using this dip pen to write this. <clears throat> so this image is an up-close version of what the a slide we showed earlier showing the, the cursive version there. And so there's a, another document, though, that was written by Sequoia, too, uh, this shows the syllabary as it was modified to what we would later know in the printing press. Uh, so there's a, a period between 1821, when Sequoia finalized it, and 1828, when the first issue of the Cherokee Phoenix came out. So in that seven-year period, most Cherokees were writing by hand. Uh, so this, in this period is when the handwritten version started evolving into the print version that we would see with the printing press. And in this time, too, that's when most Cherokees were learning syllabary and by this handwritten means. So there's a distinct you know, change in how it was developed to how it become by the time the Cherokee Phoenix came out. And uh, there was an interesting distinction, too, between uh, the printed syllabary, which is mostly used by the Cherokee Nation government and the missionaries, versus the handwritten Cherokee documents, which were primarily the community people. So a lot of those uh, were things like uh, church records, you know, there were stump dance records, there were just general uh, letters back and forth between people, there were signs, so the, this, basically the everyday life of Cherokees were captured more in the handwriting initially. And so another interesting feature of the syllabary is when you look at it, uh, you, the, you see charts now, if you go into the classroom, like at the immersion school, you'll see a Cherokee chart, or Cherokee syllabary chart, it's in a certain order. Initially, that was not the order that Sequoia actually made it in. Uh, so it's slightly different from what it would become. Uh, Sequoia's original arrangement is the order in which Cherokees were learning the syllabary when it first came out. So in that seven year period, the order of it was different and that's how Cherokees were learning it so fast. Uh, Sequoia always wrote the syllabary, like when these charts I'm showing you now that are in his hand, he always wrote the syllabary in this specific order. Uh, and then there's a letter in 1825 from second Chief Charles Hicks to the Department of uh, Indian Affairs, then he wrote it in the same order too. And so uh, 
again, the reports from missionaries and other government officials said that Cherokees were learning this in a matter of days, so it's safe to assume that Sequoia's arrangement order of the syllabary was guided by some kind of systematic logic uh, that made sense to Cherokees at the time. Uh, so Samuel Wooster, uh, the missionary who was working with Cherokees at the time, and the printers of the Cherokee Phoenix, uh, they're the ones that ended up modifying that order that we're talking about. So. There were non-Cherokees, Isaac Harris and John Wheeler, who actually put together the typeset and printed the uh, Cherokee Phoenix. But they had a journeyman printer named John Candy who was Cherokee. So with John Candy, he helped them arrange a syllabary in a different order out of need, uh, basically to be practical when they're printing the Cherokee Phoenix newspaper. So most of the printers didn't know syllabary, they didn't know Cherokee, so they had to rearrange it uh, where they could understand it. So according to uh, Marianne Littlefield, she's a, she was the wife of Dan Littlefield, who was a, a very renowned scholar for Cherokee history. Uh, Isaac Harris had difficulty learning the syllabary, so the printer, uh, John Wheeler, made a, a case to hold all the typeset. And so with this, they placed the six vowels at the top of the case, and they arranged the rest of the characters to follow the Cherokee sounds nearest to the English sounds of the English alphabet. So that's how we ended up with that chart that we're all familiar with now. Uh, Samuel Wooster went on to explain the difference in these arrangements in the Cherokee Phoenix, and he also included an explanation of the syllables in the newspaper, which is what you see on the screen now. This is actually an excerpt from the Cherokee Phoenix that shows that article talking about that. Uh, at the time, too, initially Sequoia had 86 characters. Uh, the group decided that they would drop one of them uh, they felt it wasn't used all that much, so that was the Ma character. Uh, and actually, the Cherokee leader George Lowry is the one who just suggested to drop that character. So that resulted in the 85 that we use now, even though they're 86 initially. <clears throat> so, what you see on screen now is the comparison of, uh, again, is Sequoia's cursive versus the modern equivalent, and it's in, it's in Sequoia's uh, ordered arrangement. So there is a, a, a researcher, she's a Cherokee Nation citizen named Ellen Cushman. Uh, she's author of the book, Cherokee Syllabary, uh, Writing the People's Perseverance. Uh, and so she theorizes that Sequoia's arrangement was based on the core visual shapes of his original cursive. So if you study and compare the shapes, you'll recognize some of the shapes in the original cursive. And uh, she also suggests that the ordered arrangement of Sequoia may have been some sort of acrostic to help somebody remember it, or even a mnemonic device of some kind. So when the learners were looking at the syllabary in this order, it would make a lot of sense to them as they were trying to figure out what to, how to write this. Uh, so there are more recent accounts. Uh, such There's an undated booklet that was put out by the Cherokee Bilingual Education Program in the uh, late 70s or early 80s. And this states that they, they got information from the communities, they went out and interviewed people, and what they got back was basically the community was saying that the syllabary was informed by things Sequoia witnessed in real life. Uh, an example is some of the shapes look like a cane, so maybe his walking stick, uh, even the movement of insects or the shapes of animals. So what you see on screen here is some excerpts from that book that they put out that shows some of the characters and how they might resemble some of these ideas. In addition to that, uh, you know, some of the shapes suggest maybe movement. And so there, is a, there was a Cherokee traditionalist and former deputy chief, uh, Tasting Shade. Uh, he wrote a lot of this stuff down himself in books, and he uh, has an unpublished collection of Cherokee history that uh, his wife had recently passed as well, where the Shade gave me a copy of and let me cite. So I'm going to quote from this uh, document that Tasting Shade had written. He says, he turned to nature to help him with this project. He looked at the birds, animals, and insects. As you look at his original alphabet, you'll see where these things had a great influence on his work. Sequoia saw where a worm had crawled and made a character from the track it left in the dust and gave it a sound. He looked at the birds and how they flew, sometimes in circles and loops, so he made a character and gave it a sound too. This is how the first syllabary was made. So that, that's a very interesting you know, account of how people may believe the uh, Sequoia made the syllabary. Uh, Sequoia himself left no actual written record of his thinking of what was going on uh, behind the process, so we will never definitely know what was going on in his mind about this, but it's interesting to really think about a Cherokee being influenced by the environment and things that they were observing out in nature. Uh, it just shows again the, 
the creativity and the intellectuals of Cherokee people. You know, Sequoia was definitely a genius when he was working on this this idea. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there was a time uh, between when Cherokees were writing uh, handwriting versus the print, and so Cherokees were actively using the syllabary at this point. Uh, Samuel Wooster describes how fast people started learning. Uh, he said within days of his arrival, because he was a missionary, he was sent there to the Cherokee Nation in the southeast. He said within three days he noticed that basically everyone in the area he came in contact with was learning the syllabary or had already known it. And this was in 1825, so in about four years it was almost universally accepted among the Cherokee people. And he says that Cherokees wrote letters to each other, they kept records, they translated numerous texts, they wrote down Cherokee medicine, uh, they made road signs, uh, just basically everything I mentioned earlier, everyday life of being a Cherokee person, they use the, the syllabary to communicate in their language. Uh, so what you see on screen now is a, an example of the evolutionary process of modifying the syllabary from Sequoia's cursive handwriting to what it become in the pr printed typeset. Uh, the reason it was modified, uh, because when you think of using a, a pen, to write these shapes, uh, if they had to carve that into lead type to make a mold of these characters, they couldn't make those very fine shapes that great because they would break or they bleed or what you know they wouldn't show up very well on printed paper. So they went through this process to simplify them for for the print. Uh, so an interesting aspect of this is sometimes Samuel Wooster is giving a lot of credit for making this transition. But more recent research suggests that he had just a very small part in this process. Uh, of course, you know, he did play a role in helping Cherokees get the, the printing press, but we don't want to, you know, make, we don't want him to lose his place of honor among Cherokee people in history because uh, he was a good friend and champion of the Cherokee cause at the time. But uh, scholars like Dr. Cushman, I mentioned earlier, and Willard Walker, have argued in favor of the idea that Cherokees had a much stronger hand in actually guiding the whole development process of the syllabary after Sequoia had finished his final designs on it. So in 1825, the Cherokee National Council voted the appropriate funds to build a printing office at New Chota, and they also wanted to purchase a printing press and a cast of the Cherokee type. Uh, so this basically meant that at that point, the council formally adopted the Cherokee syllabary as the official Cherokee writing system of Cherokee Nation. Uh, in that year, of, uh, July of that year, they contracted a company called Baker and Grill. They were a type foundry in Boston to actually make the typeset. Uh, this was based on recommendations from Samuel Wooster, Charles Six, and George Lowry. They got in contact with them, made the contract. And at, cause at this time, when, and if you look at the historical picture, Sequoia had already left uh, the Cherokee Nation East. He had moved west with the, some of the old settlers in Arkansas. <laughs> so there's a book called Cherokee Indian Newspapers, uh, which is a very good history about the printing and things like this for the, the Cherokee language. Uh, the author, Colin Joe Holland, he describes some of the modifications that were made from the cursive to the typeset. And he says, in casting the Cherokee type, the Boston Foundry had simplified some letters and changed a few others in order to make them distinct from the symbols. Uh, the handwritten syllabary presented characters with numerous thin line marks and sweeping strokes that would have been difficult to duplicate in type. So again, the historical record does show that making these intricate shapes was very difficult at the time. That's why they uh, modified it. Uh, <clears throat> and again, they ended up with 85, even if there were 86 total that Sequoia made. So of the 85 of these characters that were sent to Boston to be struck in type, 69 of the characters needed completely new designs to be printed. Uh, so according to an al analysis uh, by Dr. Cushman, 67 of the char of Sequoia's cursive characters, they, mean it, they have a direct contact or direct correlation between the print version and the cursive version. You can see these shapes that appear in the cursive part. Uh, so that means that there were some characters that were totally uniquely Cherokee in visual design versus some that people say now look like English. So the thinking is, you know, Sequoia was borrowing these ideas from other languages. Uh, but it is a little bit uh, deeper than that when you start looking at uh, the arrangement that Sequoia has. So uh, 
In a letter to the missionary Jeremiah Everts in 1827, Samuel Wooster states that they wouldn't need to make new characters out of 16 of these, uh, exa uh, these uh, Cherokee syllables. And he lists them as, uh, you know, I'm not going to read all of them to you, but there are 16 characters. And on the screen, what you see now is you'll see the English character set that looks like the English characters. And you'll see the Cherokee syllabary that resembles the English. And you, at the bottom, you'll see the a chart that shows Sequoia's original arrangement. So if you start to read the, the uh, or pronounce these in Cherokee the way they sound, they follow the order of Sequoia's arrangement. So you have a, a, la, na, la, and so on. And they're following that exact order that Sequoia had in his original chart. So again, this supports, there, there's an idea, so there's some kind of logic at play when they select these, these particular characters to be uh, borrowed from what you know, people say is the English character set. So in the same letter, uh, Samuel Wooster uh, wrote, writes back to Jeremiah Everts and he says that the design of these characters, uh, they were done under the close watch of John Ross and George Lowry. So they were the ones making the decisions on how these would change, uh, not, not Samuel Wooster himself. So even he himself in his own letters says that they, they made these decisions to change the shapes of the characters. Uh, so what you see on screen now is, again, this is the syllabary, but this is written by Deputy Chief Charles Hicks, and he's following that same order of Sequoia. Uh, so this is another piece of in, fa in favor, showing that uh, Samuel Wooster had the limited input on in how this syllabary was evolved and how it changed. Uh, Charles Hicks sent this letter to uh, Thomas McKinney, who was head of the Office of Indian Affairs in, at the time. Uh, this was nine months even before Samuel Wooster arrived on the scene in the Cherokee Nation. Uh, so this version of the syllabary that, that Charles Hicks had written is very close in the form of what the syllabary would actually become when they got set into typeset. Uh, so this engraving was included in the letter from the Secretary of War to the Committee of Indian Affairs. So this had reached the highest levels of the U.S. government at the time. They were seeing that Cherokees were in the process of making their writing system and they were very intrigued by this concept. So they paid pretty close attention to what was going on in Cherokee Nation. <clears throat> so some of the typeset, uh, when removal occurred, uh, the printing press was shut down and destroyed, and they threw uh, the, the uh, Georgian Guard threw the typeset into. They threw it away in the rivers and the wells and things. So, they, the, the idea is they wanted to you know, crush this Cherokee intellectual movement. Uh, but some of those pieces of typeset that were they tried to destroy were excavated uh, from the site in 1954. Uh, several decades later, a printmaker named Frank Brannan. Uh, he analyzed these pieces of type, of Cherokee type, that were excavated from the, the wells and the rivers, and he published his findings. And he found that the Cherokee uh, type was set at 10 point small caps, and the English type was at, set at 10 point size, which means, in terms of printing, the technical side of it is that the Cherokee silver is slightly smaller than the English, so that helped them differentiate between the characters that look like the English characters versus those that were Cherokee. And Brandon also mentions that the printer John Wheeler himself, uh, in a note, said that the Cherokees were the Cherokee syllabary was in placed in small caps. Uh, so what you see on screen right here is uh, an example of printing. The top half of it is in English, the bottom half is in Cherokee. So you'll see that the Cherokee syllabary is just a little bit smaller than the English typeset. And again, that helped the printers kind of. Make the, they, they knew which characters, if they were working in English or in Cherokee, so they wouldn't mess some of the, or switch some of the characters up that resembled each other in the language. So, there, you know, there are other characters in uh, Cherokee Silver that look like other languages as well. So if you notice on this, what you see on screen now is uh, some, some of the syllabary that resemble Greek characters. Uh, so the Cherokee syllable yay, uh, resembles the Greek beta. Uh, lay in Cherokee resembles the lowercase Greek delta. Uh, gua in Cherokee resembles the lowercase epsilon in Greek. Na uh, resembles uh, lowercase theta. U resembles the lowercase sigma. And gue resembles the lowercase omega.
Uh, so this shows, you know, again, there was some influence from other language groups in the development of the syllabary, and part of it was because these characters already existed in an existing typeset. Uh, so it made it easier for the people who are making the printed letters to put this together, rather than making all these extra new special shapes, they could borrow from these others and modify them slightly. And so there are also other sources that say Sequoia was influenced by other languages too. Uh, in Grant Foreman's biography of Sequoia, he quotes an interview from Captain John Stanley or Stewart from 1837 where he says that Sequoia said he found a newspaper on a roadside and saw some of the characters in that and he thought they would be make they'd be easier to make than what he had actually designed. <clears throat> and again George Lowry, uh, he related a story of how uh, in 1809 when Sequoia first started working on the syllabary uh, Sequoia w actually wanted to sign his work as a silversmith. Uh, so Sequoia asked Charles Hicks to write his name in English. So Sequoia is said to actually sign his pieces of silversmithing work in English. Uh, so that's an interesting connection there for him using some of these characters. Uh, he would sign his name in English on armbands and courgettes that he was making. Uh, John Howard Payne says that Sequoia initially borrowed uh, some characters from German letters too. Uh, they said he came across an English Bible at the home of some friends, and he studied the letters in that, and he claimed that that would be good too for print, while his cursive would be good for handwriting. Uh, so after all this was said and done, you know, again, it took about seven years for them to go through this process. Uh, the very first printing of Cherokee appeared in 1827, December 1827. Uh, this was the first five lines of the book of Genesis. Uh, these were sent to the missionary board uh, at this to show that all the work was complete and they were ready to publish the Cherokee Phoenix. Uh, so after you know, seeing all this, Samuel Wooster definitely aided in the process uh, by helping interface with the, the type foundry in Boston and the missionary board in Cherokee Nation. But other languages influenced Sequoia as well. And, uh, but overall, it was a very thoroughly Cherokee invention uh, and the documented evidence suggests that it was George Lowry, Charles Hicks, Sequoia, and John Ross, mostly, who were the key players in actually making the syllabary ready uh, for mass consumption in the printing press. Again, and keep in mind there's era, this when the, there was a big push for removal, which would result in the Cherokee, uh, Trail of Tears removal and other tribes as well. Uh, and during this time, Samuel Wooster moved his family west ahead of schedule two, uh, prior to the forced removal. Uh, after the printing press was dismantled in New Uchoda, uh, they wanted to establish a new press out in Indian Territory. So he uh, established a press at uh, Union Mission, which was an old Osage mission uh, in Indian Territory. They shipped this new printing press by a steamboat out to the west. Uh, so as Samuel Wooster describes in his letters, uh, this new set of type that arrived in Indian Territory was slightly different from the previous set that was uh, found in the East that got destroyed. And he describes that some of the characters needed even more modifications after uh, what they'd seen while had been made at Boston. And the, what you see on screen here is just some samples of some Cherokee uh, printings. Uh, you see one from 1829 uh, printing from the hymn book, and you see another one decades later from 1854, the same page, the same content, but you see, you can see the modifications in some of the characters. Uh, so, you know, there was still this evolution happening even decades later. Uh, one of the biggest examples that you will see here is the character Doe. It was inverted. The Doe was the one that we now know looks like a V. In the original printing of it, it looked like an ups it was upside down. Uh, eventually, it was decided that they would flip it up just to help with uh, legibility to distinguish it from the Go character, which looks like a capital A. Uh, another change was the Lee character, uh, which looks like a little, it's got a, a little hoop on top. The original one looked like a, a capital English P, so they switched that to help with the legibility as well. Uh, they did the several characters, and the idea again was because of legibility. And as they modified them, they worked with the Boston Type Foundry to make sure they made all these changes as they went along. So you can often <laughs> identify when a piece of Cherokee, a, doc, a Cherokee document was printed based on the shapes of the characters themselves who studied closely. You know, this is like from 1829, 
or this was like in 1840, or et cetera, you can kind of tell when these documents were printed. Uh, so the, the Union Press that Wooster established uh, paved the way for literacy, uh, which for Oklahoma, or in Indian Territory. Uh, soon after, uh, you know, Wooster arrived and started printing stuff, and the, the first item that he printed was actually a Creek language book at the press. Uh, but he did print other uh, things as well for Osages and Chickasaws and Cherokees as well. Uh, he printed a sick edition of the hymn book, uh, some more broadsheets showing the Cherokee syllabary. Uh, uh, he translated a lot of uh, books of the Bible, and he started publishing Cherokee almanacs in 1836. So those came out sporadically, but there are several that do still exist. Uh, eventually, though, Samuel Booster was asked by the Osages to move his uh, printing press operations elsewhere, so he moved to Park Hill, which is near Tahlequah. Uh, so this is the press that was in operation when, after removal, when the Cherokees started arriving in Indian Territory, this press was already in operation. So they used that to get the word about uh, settlements and details of how to receive payments and accept all the government operations that were required as part of the removal itself. Uh, but during the turmoil of all this, you know, post-removal and setting up of printing presses and everything else, uh, Samuel Wooster's main translator, uh, was Elias Boudinot, who was the editor of the Phoenix, and he was assassinated at this time for his part in signing the Treaty of New Chota. Uh, but despite all this, you know, they kept printing Cherokee documents, which is it's pretty fascinating to see despite all the trouble and turmoil, you know, people still kept getting the word out in Cherokee through various means. And so what you see on screen here is just a sample showing, uh, I mentioned earlier, the changing the characters, you have the go versus the do, the Li shapes the capital English looking P character, and there's a ga and a day, which look like, looks like an S, but there are very subtle differences between those two. So, this is just a sample of, of that on the screen here. Uh, and after removal, uh, a lot of the printing materials were periodicals, so there are a lot of you know, newspapers and things coming out. The very first uh, one newspaper was the Cherokee Messenger. Uh, this is what you see on screen here. This came out in 1844. It lasted a little bit, but it kind of it went out of uh, publication about 1846, I believe. Uh, also, though, in 1844, uh, the Cherokee Advocate uh, started printing. Uh, that was that would become the main Cherokee newspaper uh, after removal up to Oklahoma statehood. Uh, the Advocate. Uh, was a successor in spirit to the Cherokee Phoenix, which was shut down after removal. Uh, and for a brief time, the advocate was actually called the uh, Cherokee Phoenix and Indians Advocate. So what you see here on screen is just a sample from an uh, issue from 1881, just showing how long this was in publication. Uh, the there were Cherokee translators named James Wofford and Joseph Byrd, who provided most of the Cherokee translations. Uh, and they also hired Cherokee speakers as typesetters and as additional translators for this. So, you know, it's interesting to see uh, this happening and then and we still have that happening now. You know, our translators at Cherokee Nation now are still translating for the Cherokee Phoenix newspaper. Uh, publication of this newspaper stopped in, uh, prior, uh, prior to the Civil War. That, uh, that caused a lot of turmoil for Cherokee people too. That particular press was taken down and shipped to Fort Gibson uh, during the Civil War to protect it. Uh, when the war ended, the Cherokee National Council uh, got some funding to rebuild the printing office and uh, as they went through the challenges of rebuilding after the war, they set up the press again and they resumed printing the Advocate in 1870. So there's a period you know, during several war time when they stopped printing too. Uh, then a fire destroyed the Advocate printing office and the typeset as well. And again, it took another year to recover from that disaster, but they kept printing things in Cherokee language to this time as well. Because uh, yeah, a lot, there's a mistake that people make a lot of the time that there's only one Cherokee printing press. There were actually several in operation. So like when the advocate was going through these troubles, the printing press at Park Hill was still printing stuff as well. So there were multiple places where things were being printed. Uh, the Park Hill Press, since it was run by a missionary, was primary religious tracts and things, but they did put out some of the government documents as well and announcements from Cherokee Nation. Uh, and a lot of these... Uh, Things that they printed at the Park Hill Press did appear in the Advocate, so they would send their materials to them too, and they would get printed as well. Uh, by the time of Oklahoma statehood, <clears throat> all these printing presses were shut down, uh, 
uh, due to the allotment and the federal government's move to dissolve all the tribal governments. Uh, so the Cherokee Press was sold and it was used by the Fort Gibson New Era newspaper well up into the 1950s. So they were using the Cherokee printing press for, for many decades afterward for just their own content. The Cherokee's typeset itself was sent to the Smithsonian for, pres for preservation from that time. And so during the 19th century, it's estimated that there were over 13 million pages of Cherokee text that was printed. So there was a massive amount of Cherokee materials that were made during that time, which is a pretty astounding when you consider everything that Cherokees were going through from post removal to Civil War to allotment, that it never really slowed down the, the actual publication of materials in Cherokee language. So here are just a few examples of items that were printed. Uh, this, you see here, this is a, uh, in, a the front page of the Cherokee Rosebuds. The Cherokee Rosebuds was a uh, newsletter that was published by the Cherokee Female Seminary students. Uh, they had their own printing press as well, so they printed these documents in Cherokee and English. They would publish uh, poetry and just news about the seminary school and things like that. And so it's just neat to see that piece of history. Uh, here's an a arithmetic book published by the Cherokee Nation Press in 1870. So, the, you know, they were teaching all these subjects in schools, math, history, uh, grammar, but it was all done in Cherokee. And here's an excerpt from a pictorial book uh, from 1888, printed in Tahlequah, and this is, it looks like this is a, from the story of the Tower of Babel. So they were printing, you know, religious tracts as well, but there was a lot of stuff that was being printed. Uh, this is from uh, another religious uh, publication about baptism. Uh, another hymn book. Uh, an interesting thing, though, uh, at the end of the, when it, the 20th century arrived, and most people assumed that there was nothing ever made in Cherokee again, but that's not true. Uh, despite the Cherokee government being in shambles, they were still printing in syllabary. Most of it was from federal government documents and proclamations. Uh, there was a 1909 edition of a hymn book that was printed. Uh, there were, again, there were still Cherokees writing letters to each other. Uh, even though they didn't have a printing press, they were still making materials. Uh, what you see on screen at the moment is actually an interesting uh, example of uh, printing. This is from uh, the 1918 pamphlet on infectious diseases and hygiene, which was put out during the pandemic of 1917. Uh, so Cherokees were always, you know, leading the way in terms of, you know, just getting out the word of the public for public health and things like that, too. Uh, so it's really relevant to today when you think what we're going through now with the pandemic. Cherokee Nation is still doing similar things. We're printing uh, notices and things in English and in Cherokee. So most of the documents that were made, though, in the early 20th century weren't printed. They were mostly handwritten documents. And so these are in the form of uh, ledgers from churches and businesses, uh, stomp grounds. Uh, there are meeting notes from various events, there are family records, there are Cherokee medicinal writings, uh, there are even actual just medical records too, they're all written and celebrated from this time. Uh, and just a small sampling of things that were printed in Cherokee, uh, someone, yeah, well that written in Cherokee I should say, someone wrote a menu, uh, so they wrote what they were eating from a meeting of the Night Hot Katua Society in a 1901 meeting. Uh, they, there is another and that's a description of services offered for the sick and the dead at Fairfield Baptist Church from 1915. There are notes by a medicine man about a, a female client he was treating in 1920. Uh, there, there's a bundle of love letters that were found in Cherokee from the 1930s. Uh, someone had written an opinion about World War II. Uh, there's the you know, meeting minutes of Sunday schools. And there's even a, a letter that someone, or a note that someone wrote I've uh, feeling disaffected about the fate of Cherokee people from 1963. So all through these decades, people, Cherokee people were recording their thoughts and feelings on matters and you know, informing the public. Uh, so again, it shows how, how people you know, persevered through all this and how resilient the Cherokee people are and we still are. So during the early part of the 20th century, uh, any official business conducted by Cherokee Nation was done under, under chiefs who were appointed temporarily. Uh, this is known as chiefs for a day. Uh, 
so while some chiefs served more than that, more than a day, but the phrase demonstrates the, na the nature of tribal governance at the time. It was very iffy, you know, not very stable. But one of the chiefs from this era, J.B. Milam, was appointed principal chief of Cherokee Nation in 1941. During his tenure as chief, uh, Milam pushed to include Cherokee language instruction in public schools. And he wanted the language to be taught in college courses in Oklahoma. So his push for language resulted in a renewed interest in Cherokee printing. He sent a copy of the Cherokee Silverade to the University of Oklahoma, and they created a set of type to create uh, Cherokee language materials at the university then. Uh, in the 1960s, the Carnegie Corporation Cross-Cultural Education out of Chicago uh, started a project in Telequal called the Cherokee Phoenix Publications. Not, this isn't the same historical newspaper, but they just borrowed that name basically. Uh, but Cherokee Phoenix Publications, they, they had a set of Cherokee typeset made too in the 60s uh, for the purpose of creating Cherokee language materials for the communities in Northeast Oklahoma. Uh, so this, this program printed many Cherokee documents from the time, including a 1965 Cherokee primer, which we still use in the immersion school. And there is a collection of Cherokee stories by uh, the Cherokee uh, Willard Walker. Uh, so. This, this group also uh, started a newsletter, which you see on screen here, and it was called a Cherokee Speaker. Uh, the Cherokee Speaker newsletter came out of Chicago, actually, and uh, they, in their newsletter, they said that they bought a set of Cherokee type from Cherokee Phoenix Publications in Tahlequah. So uh, the cost of this Cherokee type, anybody could order a set. It said it included about 4,000 pieces of a Cherokee typeset, and it could be purchased for $50 plus shipping and handling. So that kind of gives you a price range of how much it costs to make this stuff back in that era. So as, as the printing technology evolved, uh, pretty much every form of writing technology that came across, that came out, was adapted to Cherokee syllabary. Uh, so you have various styles of uh, typewriters from the early 1900s to the mid 20th century. And then the, the big breakthrough came in 1975 when the Cherokee Nation Bilingual Education, a program in Telequah, uh, under the direction of Agnes Cowan, developed the Cherokee Syllabary Hermes brand typewriter. Uh, this typewriter you know, helped make Cherokee documents pretty rapidly if you didn't have access to a printing press, which is a very technical type of you know, way of making documents. Uh, so if you compare the shapes of the characters on the typewriter uh, from the earlier typeset from the uh, Carnegie Corporation group, you'll see that the characters kind of match. So this Hermes typewriter took those shapes from that, uh, those, that set of type to the typewriter. Uh, according to an article in the Tulsa Tribune from the time, this was, they said this was the only typewriter, the only Cherokee typewriter that existed in Oklahoma. Uh, eventually more would have been made though at that point. So soon afterward IBM uh, in introduced the Selectric typewriter. Uh, what this did was allow people to switch out uh, different sizes of type and different, they could do bold and italic and that, that type of thing on a typewriter. Uh, so when they did that, someone had the idea of well, why not do this in Cherokee? So in the mid 70s, uh, the Cherokee Nation got funding to produce a silver typewriter element that could be placed in these typewriters. So that's what you see here on screen. Uh, the tribe first approached IBM themselves directly, but it proved it was too expensive to make these. They were roughly $30,000 to develop a prototype of Cherokee. Uh, so the tribe then contacted a group called the Camwell Group in Hawaii, to, and they said they could produce this element for $5,000. So half the cost was covered partially by a grant received the, from the Episcopalian Church, uh, and the other cost was covered by Cherokee Nation's revenue uh, sharing funds at the time. Uh, so once this whole process was completed, the typewriter elements were sold in the Cherokee Nation gift shop for $95 each. Uh, the syllabary shapes on these typewriter elements uh, looked exactly the same as the Hermes typewriter before which just a few minor differences. Uh, so many schools and universities and even individuals in the community who had access to a typewriter now, they could create Cherokee language documents on their own. Uh, one of the most influential Cherokee publications from this technology is the uh, Durban Feeling Cherokee English Dictionary, which came out in 1975. Uh, this was typeset uh, 
using one of these typewriter elements by Adeline Proctor. Uh, so yeah, I got to interview her and talk about her experience using this typewriter to type the, the content that Durban Feeling was collecting from the community. And so this dictionary is still in use today among uh, Cherokee people. It's used heavily in the Cherokee Nation revitalization programs. Uh, so it was a major document, a major thing, a major resource that we still, still use now. So when you think of the syllabary, it is a very unique uh, invention in the world. You know, it's fascinated people for the longest time. And that fascination still was happening in, in the 1970s. Uh, you know, when the Cherokee Phoenix came out in the 1828s or 1830s, uh, it, there were many Europeans that subscribed to the newspaper. So there were people from around the world that were reading uh, the Cherokee Phoenix stories at the time. Uh, so its reach was well beyond Cherokee Nation itself. And so, uh, again, that fascination carried on to this era we're in, in the 1970s. So when you look at history in the 70s is when computers were becoming more mainstream. You know, there was efforts to make them smaller so they could be in homes and things. So in 1976, uh, Herman Zopf uh, was commissioned to make a Cherokee uh, font for a computer. Uh, Herman Zopp is significant because uh, a lot of the fonts that you use on your computer now are developed by him initially. Uh, so he was working in a Cherokee font back in 1976. Uh, the idea for the font was to be used for, uh, for early personal computers, but it didn't actually appear in a, a Cherokee or system until uh, uh, Apple adopted it later. Uh, but Herman Zopp's design as one of the very first major developments in the process of bringing the syllabary into the digital age. And so what you see on screen is the actual sketch uh, from his sketchbook showing the uh, syllabary that he was working on for this uh, very first Cherokee computer font. Uh, in 1985, uh, Durban Feeling, he collaborated with William Cox. Uh, he was an attorney uh, from Louisiana and so what they did, they developed the very first Cherokee word processing software. Uh, what you see on screen is actually the very first Cherokee word process document. Uh, Durbin had this in his files and he was kind enough to give me a copy of it. So uh, the program itself was based on software uh, ba from a company called Rising Star Industries in California. Uh, and in order to type this, it was a number system. So on the keyboard, the most commonly used syllable was numbered, it was number one, and the least used was number 85. So as you, you have to figure out how many times, or which characters were used the most, which were used the least. Uh, so in 1987, uh, Durbin and uh, the attorney, William Cox, they did a demonstration of this uh, software to Chief William Mankiller. Uh, and so what they did is they printed out a, the Lord's Prayer, a sample uh, of a Cherokee language lesson, and a printed letter to the chief. Uh, so that's what you see on screen here is actually that printed letter to Chief Wilma Mankiller. And so I'll quote a small part of it. It says, with equal pride and sense of accomplishment, we hereby present you with this copy of the files which allow for the first time the use of the modern word process, uh, processing computer to print, write, and publish the Cherokee language. And so this development really kick-started the, the way forward for Cherokee uh, language fonts to be in use during the 90s and the early 2000s. And so these fonts provided very useful and practical uh, ways for Cherokees to continue creating Cherokee language content using desktop publishing on computers uh, up until the internet age when another forward evolution had to happen to continue using syllabary properly on uh, computing devices. So this happened because in 1994, there was a student at Yale named Joe LaCicero who was interested in writing systems and letter forms. And he, he uh, started a discussion on a Yale uh, mailing list about Unicode. Uh, and Unicode is an international standards body that governs how the world's uh, writing systems are displayed in computing systems. So anytime you use a digital device that shows letters or words, writing, whatever, if it's uh, your laptop, your phone, you see the kiosk at the store, you, at the little screen at the gas station, anything that has writing on it, Unicode dictates how these systems communicate and display letter forms to you. And the way it works is every character in the world has a unique uh, computer number assigned to it. So these computers can read these code points and display the right letters. 
so in 1995, at Durban, I uh, worked with Dr. Gloria Sly, who was director of the Cherokee Nation Cultural Resource Center at the time, to figure out a way, how can we get Cherokee into the system? So they got in contact with a gentleman named Michael Everson, who is an expert on Unicode script encoding. And they submitted a proposal to the Unicode Consortium to get Cherokee syllabary encoded into the system. And so this is a somewhat involved process. So it took several years to make get through all the committees and things, and they finally voted on it. And, and in the year 2000, the proposal was approved, and Cherokee was given its own code point range in Unicode. So this paved the way for you know, where we are now, uh, Cherokee fonts on phones and you know, blogs, social media, whatever, anywhere you see where you can write something, you can write in syllabary now. So uh, in the early 90s, there were a handful of fonts in Cherokee that worked, but they weren't Unicode, so they couldn't be used on the unit as efficiently. Uh, so this created a lot of compatibility problems uh, when people were trying to share Cherokee language documents with each other. So with this new Unicode technology, the syllabary could actually be transposed across different devices and the different people, regardless if they had the proper font on their machine or not. It would take several years before this trickled down to the community. Uh, that was roughly in 2003. That's when Apple started incorporating uh, Cherokee support into their computer systems. Uh, this was because their founder, Steve Jobs, was interested in calligraphy and writing systems, and he was familiar with the work of Herman Zopf with the Cherokee uh, fonts. So that's how this Cherokee font entered the Apple uh, systems at that time, the computer systems. A few years later, uh, Cherokee Nation would collaborate with Apple again to get the writing on their mobile devices and their other, other operating systems as well. So now every Apple device has Cherokee language on it. Uh, that paved the way forward for other companies to come and want to have Cherokee language support as well. So we have Microsoft and Google. Facebook, again, pretty much any kind of uh, computer system or, or software now that can support writing, there is a Cherokee language option. And so in 2008, uh, students at the Cherokee Immersion School began receiving Apple laptops so they could do their work in Cherokee. The goal was to have the entire school in Cherokee language, and that included their homework. So they needed a way to do the homework and move past you know, paper and pencil so they could type their assignments in, in Cherokee language. Uh, so that was you know, a big part of the mission, so it helped make, fulfill that goal really well. All through time, or the modern, uh, through modern time, we have all sorts of devices that can display our Cherokee language now, so, which is a huge leap forward, and it's, it's interesting to think about how Sequoia would have seen all this stuff. So I'm going to wrap up here in a bit, and we're going to jump back in time a little bit, just to put in the context now that you've seen kind of how it evolved from Sequoia's original handwriting to where it is now. Uh, when you think of the United States at the time, it was a fairly new country. Uh, so what was happening is the United States, their citizens, none of, most of them weren't naturally born here. You know, they were adults, they migrated here. So they were trying to find their own identity. And part of that was through their own writing. There was movements to get an English, uh, American English basically, their own writing, their own alphabet, to move away from the British system. And so when they seen that Cherokees had their own writing system, that made a big impact on them too. So you, you think about Noah, Noah Webster, who is famous for Webster's Dictionary. Uh, he had attended a talk by the Cherokee Phoenix editor Elias Boudinot, where Elias Boudinot was talking about uh, Cherokee Nation and how civilized everyone was because we had a writing system, a writing system and have literature and prints. And so this demonstrated to, to Noah Webster that, you know, you could have your own identity through a writing system. And so in the same year that the Cherokee Phoenix appeared in 1828, the first edition of the Webster Dictionary actually came out too. So when you think of Cherokees, a Cherokee syllabary had a much larger impact than just Cherokees ourselves. It impacted the world around us. And that's still happening. <clears throat> and so when you, Sequoia himself, you know, he's kind of become an uh, outlandish figure in a way because people don't know him as a person. He's mythological. They see him uh, and this image of him and everyone just thinks, well, he's, he's our hero, but no one thinks of him as a person. And so I like to include this story that I came across about him where he, uh, he went to uh, 
Washington, D.C. in 1828 as part of a delegation to negotiate a treaty. Uh, when he was there, uh, he met President Adams, and you know they, they met, and through an interpreter, Adams had a conversation with him, and after the fact, the president wrote in his notes that he was you know very impressed you know meeting this uh, really stately Cherokee man, and he, he says this quote here I want to read. Uh, this is John Quincy Adams' letters. He said, I found myself afterwards that he sent me a copy of this alphabet with the letter intimating that if it was thought that the United States ought to give him a gratuity of $6,000 for his invention. So it's not recorded as the court actually received that payment or not, but I like to say, talk about this because it shows that he has a sense of humor. You know, like, if you think I'm so great, why don't you give me some money for what I've done, you know? So I think that's a really great way to kind of celebrate him. Just He was a person, too. You know, just like everyone else, we have our personalities and, you know, little oddities we like, so he had that, too. Sequoia... You know, he had a profound impact on Cherokees, one that we still feel. Uh, so in a sense, we kind of end where we started uh, with the Cherokee Phoenix. Uh, the Cherokee Phoenix is still in publication now, uh, and we, it still has content in Cherokee syllabary too. Uh, they actually do one issue a year now that's all Cherokee, the all Cherokee language issue with the Cherokee Phoenix, which is usually released around the Cherokee holiday. Uh, so I think Sequoia would be very proud to see that you know his his mission is still going, and I like to think uh, you know it, it, his example is a really good uh, example of the resiliency of Cherokee people. I know we keep talking about this word and what it means, but what does it mean when you say we are resilient? It just shows that no matter what, uh, you, you keep going, you keep fighting, and even though if you know our language is endangered. Uh, you know, this idea that we need to keep fighting. Uh, Sequoia left us a tool for that fight, and I believe we're on a good path forward. You know, we have a lot of initiatives going forward at Cherokee Nation for language revitalization. So, you know, I hope that everyone joins in this fight and, and just in a way honoring Sequoia to continue using his uh, Cherokee writing system because it's gonna, it re, you know, it, like I said earlier, it unites everybody, uh, all Cherokees, regardless of political stances, uh, religious beliefs, blood quantum, or even geographic boundaries, uh, the silver unites us all. So we, that's something all, we all can connect to. Well, that's a really great question, actually. Well, there is the the stories about him, you know, being accused of you know being a witch or playing with bad medicine or something. And there are even some accounts that say he was scarred by like people. They scarred him as punishment for doing this. And I think, oh, that's kind of a bit extreme. But I think maybe he might have been a bit eccentric too. I mean, yeah, you know, I think someone that's going to sit down and try to make a system like that kind of has to have a little bit of you know, something there to, to want to do that. But having said that too, for him to be successful with it, I mean, he had to have a high level of intelligence and uh, even just, you know, a, the ability to function as a, in a regular person to do this, because if he didn't, he would never finished it. And the putting this together, this logical system that he did, you know, it takes a lot of intellect to do something like that. And like, as I was discussed in the presentation, you know, if you look at his original arrangement of the order, he had a system there. We don't really know what it is now. We, uh, some of our translators have looked at it. Some have their theories, but we still don't know exactly why he put it in that order and why it was so successful, but it was. You know, Cherokees at that time could see that order and they learned it really quickly. So there was a reason why it was like that. So the fact that he could put together such a logical system, I think really shows that, you know, he was, he might have been a bit eccentric, but he was, overall he was a really astounding person and definitely a genius. Yeah, I have friends that joke I'm obsessed with Sequoia just because I've painted him so often. 
But but one reason why he fascinates me is you know not just the syllabary because you know I, I do have the privilege of working in the tricky language department, so I'm around. Yeah, I see Silver every day, and I work with translators who can read and write this. So it is a fascinating thing to see this, in which is still going. But uh, the man himself is a very fascinating figure, just because so little is known about him. We everyone knows who he is. Basically, he's one of the most famous Cherokees ever lived. You know, he's got his uh, statue in uh, Washington D.C. and in Oklahoma State Capitol. You know, he's, he's everyone recognizes his image. But even that that image of him. Sometimes, you know, that's questionable. Some say that's not really him in that portrait, that he sent his cousin in his place to sit for him. You know, so there are lots of stories about him that just kind of keep, keep the mystery going. So I think for me as an artist, I'm fascinated by that aspect of just trying to find out more about him as a person and what was he like as a person versus just this, you know, one image we have of him, of him having holding that tablet pointing at the syllabary. You know, he, he lived a life, he had his thoughts, and I, I think it's ironic that, you know, he, he invented our writing system, but we have no real substan substantial uh, pieces of writing left behind by him. We have a couple of syllabary charts, and we have a number chart of his numbers that he made that we didn't really take up, but that's all we have that's left that we know of that was actually written by him. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up here. What else?